Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from Luke chapter 15, and I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 3, and then I'm going to jump over to verse 11. And this is what it says. Now all the tax gatherers and sinners were coming near him and listening to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And he told them this parable, saying, now verse 11, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And he divided his wealth between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be in need. And he went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating. And no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. And he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For the son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things might be. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry, and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began entreating him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours, yet... You never gave me a kid that I might be merry with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your wealth with harlots, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, My child, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. We had to be merry and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, was lost, and has been found. Pray with me. Lord, this morning, may we recognize your voice and respond from death to life. That we might know the strength of your spirit within us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
I don't remember the time, but I do remember the feeling. It was a long time ago, and my brother, my sister, the in-laws, my parents, we were all, and all the kids, the, the cousins, nieces, nephews, were at my parents' house. We'd finished dinner, and the adults were upstairs swapping stories, and all the kids were in kid heaven downstairs. Uh, my father had every toy imaginable, so the grandkids would, his grandkids would enjoy themselves downstairs. And we knew that as long as there was noise coming up from the downstairs, everything was good. Silence meant danger. They were either plotting quiet revolution or blood had been spilt. Those were about the only two choices when silence hit. It got quiet downstairs. Well, everyone upstairs said, shh, 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 we need to listen. Well, that's when we could hear the, uh, all, all the cousins, all the boy cousins whispering to each other, I'm not going to tell him, you tell him. And then the others, I'm not going to tell you, you tell him. And that's when my son Taylor, the youngest of all the boy cousins, he piped up and he said, I'll tell him. And so he went upstairs. We could hear, he was about six years old and he padded up the stairs and, and then he went to my father. He said, Pops, can we play pool on your pool table? That's when my father turned to my son and said, said, yes, but there's dust on the cover. So when you uncover the pool table, don't let all that dust fall on the pool table because then I have to clean my pool table. And he said, and, and but you boys, I, I know how you like to play swords with my pool sticks. You knock off the tips of my pool sticks, so don't be playing swords with my pool sticks. And if you look up at the ceiling, you can see every time that you, you boys were, were, were celebrating and you raised up the pool stick and you poked a hole in my ceiling or marks all over my ceiling. And I, look at that. Don't, don't be raising your pool sticks and, and, and poking holes in the ceiling. My father, my son, the whole time was saying, yes, sir, yes, sir, no, sir, no, sir, yes. Sir. And then he, he turned to walk away. He took about two steps, and then he turned back, and he said, Pops, was that a yes or a no? <laughs> well, sometimes yes can sound a whole lot like no. If, if you put enough prohibitions around it, if you put enough instructions around it, if you put enough commands around it, yes will sound a whole lot like no. Well, that's what was going on in Jesus' day. All they could hear was the no of God. And people thought that, that that's all God ever did and all God ever said was no. That's why Jesus came. So we would know the character, the nature, the voice of God. And we'd be able to, to hear and to understand it. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of God's nature. Did we look to Jesus to find out the, the, the nature, the character, the voice of God? And so Jesus tells three parables. Three parables. They're all right here. I, I read one of them. The other two I didn't. But the first parable he tells is, is a parable about a, a shepherd who had 100 sheep. One of them went missing, and the shepherd didn't say, well, 99's pretty good. I'll just stick with the 99. No, that shepherd went out to find the one that was lost, and he searched. He pursued. He was seeking the one sheep that was lost, and when he found him, he put him on his shoulder to carry him back to the fold. But he didn't just let it end there. No, he wanted folks to celebrate with him, to enter into his joy, to rejoice with him. Because the one that was lost had been found. Then he tells us, Jesus tells a story about a woman who has ten coins. Well, one of those coins went missing. Well, she didn't say, well, I still have nine coins. And nine is almost as good as ten. No, she brought out a lamp. She brought out a broom. She began to sweep. She began to search. She began to seek for that, the one coin that was lost. And when she found it, she didn't just leave it there. She wanted other folks to take part in the celebration. Take part in her joy. Rejoice with her. And that's when the party began. Well, if a, a, a sheep is, is worth a lot, a coin's worth a lot more. And what's worth the most is the child. So Jesus tells a story about a father who had two sons. 
The youngest of the sons went to the father and said, Father, you got a lot of nice stuff around here, and I know that some of it's going to be mine when you die, but I don't want to wait that long. I'd like my inheritance now, please. Surprising thing. The father said yes. And it tells us that that son went on a journey to a distant country, and he squandered it on loose living. No, it doesn't tell us any more than that. Just squandered it on loose living. Years ago, I heard a preacher preach on loose. Clearly, half of his sermon was on loose living. And he, he, he went into depth on what loose living was. He went out, that boy went out, he bought a Cadillac, fifth liquor, and he began chasing women. Well, that tells a whole lot more than what's on the preacher's mind than it does what's here in this story. It doesn't say anything about that. It just says loose living. And when he'd, he'd squandered it all, things got even worse. Famine hit. He had to get any kind of job that he could get just, just to survive. And the only job he could get was feeding pigs. Now, for the, the, the hearers to hear Jesus tell this story about a Jewish boy who went and he wound up feeding pigs, they couldn't imagine anything that was lower than that. And that's when Jesus would tell them, there's something lower, there's something lower. And it says right here, and he says in verse 16, that he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating. Now, it doesn't say what those pods were, but I know it was okra. And when that, that son started wanting okra, well, that's when he knew. He, I mean, you start wanting to eat okra, you're on the very, very bottom. You're as low as you can go. It doesn't make any difference if it's boiled or pickled or fried. You want, start wanting okra. Okra is a vegetable that has hair. And when a vegetable has hair, it's screaming to you, run away. And I have a friend who said that he ate so much boiled okra as a kid that his socks won't stay up today. <laughs> it's that old slimy stuff. You start wanting to eat that stuff, you know you've hit rock bottom. He knew he'd hit rock bottom, and that's when he began to think about his father again. He says he came to his senses, and he began to think about his father, not just his father's stuff, he began to think about his father's character. He began to think about the nature of his father and the way that his father treated his hired men. And that his father's hired men had more than enough bread to eat. That his father's nature was one that was generous. His father's nature was one that is kind. So when he hit rock bottom, this son said, I'll go to my father and I'll say, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. He's making his way back home. And here I can imagine that he's practicing it again. I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. And then in verse 20 it tells us, maybe the most beautiful verse in the whole of the Bible. It says, and while he was still a long way off. While he was still a long way off, his, his father's eyes were, were, were peeled on the horizon. While he was still in the distant country, his, his father's eyes were seeking and searching. While he was still a long way off, that his father was pursuing the son that, 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 that was lost. Well, it was still a long way off. And it says, and his father ran and embraced and kissed him. Well, he was still a long way off. And that's when the son began. To, the son hadn't said a word up to this point. And now he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And before he gets to say the last one, the father says, quickly, bring a robe Bring a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And then he says, we're having steak tonight. Uh, it's going to be a celebration. This son of mine who was dead has come to life, who was lost, has been found. And he calls others to enter into his joy, enter into the celebration, to take part in the party, that there's more than enough joy and he invites others to take part in it. 
Now, it'd be great if the story ended right there, but it doesn't. Because there's an, the son that stayed at home, and, and he, it says, tells us that he hears the music and he hears the dancing. My hunch is that he, he also smells the steak. That this son that, 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 that was longing for okra now is getting steak. And then he smells the steak, and, and he asks one of the, the servants, what is that down there? And he tells him that your brother... Your brother's back, and your father is celebrating. Well, the son's unwilling to go in. And we need to see here that the father, the father went outside the house to find the son unwilling, who was unwilling to go in. And it says that he entreats him to come in, to enter into his joy, to enter into the celebration, to enter into the party. There's steak just for you down there. But the son, the son says, says, here the son who squandered what you gave him, that you welcome him back, and, and I've never even been given a kid, a baby goat then I might be merry with my friends. And here's where I can imagine that the father puts his arm around the son. And he says, son, tell me, what, what do you see in that field over there? The son says, that's a hundred of the best cattle anywhere around him. And he goes, that's right, that's right. How do you know that they're the best? He said, because I'm the one that made sure they found pasture. I'm the one that made sure that they found water. And what do you see in that field over there? That's a hundred of the best goats anywhere. How do you know they're the best? And he says, because I'm the one that made sure that they found pasture. I'm the one that made sure that they found water. I'm the one that made sure that they were healthy. That's right. And tell me, what do you see in that field over there? He said, a hundred of the best sheep anywhere around here. Well, how do you know they're the best sheep? Because I'm the one that made sure they were sheared. I'm the one that made sure they found pasture. I'm the one that made sure they found water. I'm the one sh that made sure that they were healthy. And the father, father says, yeah, that's right. That, that all of this is yours. But you're wanting a, a goat. There's a stake on the grill with your name on it, and what you're wanting is a, is a goat to call mine. That you can, you can have something set aside for you and your friends. Jesus, Jesus is, 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 is pointing to a father that seeks and pursues with a relentless grace, with a grace that, that goes seeking, that goes searching for the son in the distant country and also the son that's right outside the door. It's a grace. It's a grace that never lets up. It's a grace that, that never lets go. But it's not enough to, to sit eating okra in the distant country while there's steak on the grill. It's not enough to, to sit eating okra and just knowing that that's the nature of the Father. To be generous and, and seeking and, and loving. It's not enough to, to sit outside the door, to, to smell the steak, to know the, the celebration, but to not take part in it. That, that Jesus has more for you and me than just that grace that pursues us. Yes, that's the beginning part of it. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's while we were in the distant country, while we were outside the door, that he died for you and me. But his desire as we enter into his joy, his desire is that we enter into life, that we take part, and we respond that Jesus, Jesus points, yes, to a father's love, but he also points 
to the response of the son, to the response of his daughters, to the response of his children to that grace. That on the cross, Jesus gave his life for you and for me, and he took all those things that would destroy us. He took that selfishness that, that wants to carve out and control a part of life and say, mine, that selfishness, that sin, that shame. That he took that fear, he took that worry, he took all those things that would destroy us, and he took it on himself, and he nailed it to the cross to kill it once and for all. He rose again on the third day that he might live his life through us with a power that gives us strength enough to respond, to answer his call, his searching, his seeking, his wooing. Jesus said in Revelation, Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. It's not enough to know his nature, his character from a distance and still be eating okra. It's not enough to, to, to know his character, his voice from a distance, but not enter into the celebration, not enter into his joy. We're called to sit down, to dine with him, to take part in his joy, to take part in his grace, to take part in the life that he offers you and me. Not withholding a little peace just for me and mine. But to give the whole of ourselves to the risen Christ. Jesus' point is yes, a father that seeks. Jesus' point is yes, that, that sons and daughters and children respond. Jesus' point is, is yes, that he rose again to give you and me life, a life that we can't get anywhere else, a life that where the risen Christ lives through us. Romans 8 Verse 11 says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells in you. Life, full, abundant, a life of joy. A life of, of peace. A life that bears fruit. In, in Galatians chapter 5, it talks about this fruit of a transformed life. Where His Spirit, where the risen Christ lives on the inside of us. It's a life of love and joy and peace, patience. It's a life of kindness, and gentleness and faithfulness. It's a life of self-control. It's a life where His Spirit, the power of the risen Christ, lives through us. And we begin to, to be transformed and live in a different way. It's the celebration. It's the joy. It's the Father who lives His life through us. This morning it may be that when I began to talk about that distant country where the son who, who had gone and squandered, squandered his inheritance that, that you knew what I was talking about, that this morning you feel like you're in a distant country. And this morning maybe God gave you a, a nudge or a shake or a thump on the head. Well, it's not enough just to know that our God is is generous. It's not enough to know that his nature is one that, that, that is giving and searching and seeking. We're called to respond. We must receive Christ. Answer the door. Answer the door this morning. It may be that you've been 
been holding back, a little piece of your life that you've been wanting to call mine, that you've been wanting to control. And you've not turned it over. This morning, I want to pray with you. Join with me in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, your desire for us is life, a life that's full and abundant, a life that celebrates in joy, a life where you live your life through us and you begin to transform us. It's not enough to know your nature and, and to lead a different life. Lord, your desire, your call is that we, we answer the door and dine with you. That we spend time with you. That your presence is one that takes over the whole of our lives and these little pieces we're trying to hang on to and control and to manage and to withhold. Through your power, we, we let go. that we say yes to you. We hear your yes and we respond with a yes. Lord, there, there are those this morning that maybe have been plugging through this pandemic, this hard time, and they've been hanging on to little pieces that they think they might can control better than you can. And of course the response is worry. Of course the response as a lack of peace. Of course, the response is, is a bitterness. Grant grace enough, power enough through your risen, ri, through the risen Christ that, that we might open our hands, open our hearts, and invite you to live your life through us. It's a transformed life you desire. A life that's abundant, full, and eternal. That the fruit of your Spirit might be made known in and through us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us. <music>